Welcome to Cooper Union, What's Happening with Human Rights Around Our World on ThinkTech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. Today, we're looking at ending poverty, the UN Global Goals and Rights, Article 22, Indispensable Dignity for All. What we're looking at is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights provides the power of ideas to initiate change in the world, and the UDHR outlines opportunities for a new direction rooted in inherent dignity in inalienable rights for dynamic, sustainable development and social democracy. The UN SDG starts with core economic, social, and cultural rights, establishing a framework for freedoms and the realization of rights through national effort and international cooperation. Today, we'll be meeting with two amazing advocates organizing around the UN high-level political forum, focusing on the UN global goals. I'd like to first introduce our colleague from Civicus and ask him to share just a little bit on what issue is so important to you in international law and what inspired you to first care about this and some important first campaigns you were involved with? Wonderful. Uh, Joshua, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you very much for organizing this conversation today. So you asked me what inspires me. In fact, Agenda 2030 inspires me. It's arguably the greatest ever human endeavor to create just, equal, and sustainable societies. In fact, it's an agenda that is comprehensive in its scope. The 169 uh, targets that are part of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals are immense in their scope. Together, they can help create better societies, more fairer societies for all of us. And the part of the goals that inspires me the most is Goal 16 on peace, justice, and strong institutions. That's really the heart of Agenda 2030 because it, within it, it guarantees uh, uh, commitments on responsive, inclusive, participatory decision-making, commitments on access to information and fundamental freedoms, which are absolutely critical for people and civil society organizations to ensure the realization of this important agenda for all of humanity. Thank you so much, Mandeep. Iglo, can you share with us a bit of why the issue of the SDGs is so important in international human rights law? And also, what inspired you to care about the issue and some of the first campaigns you're involved with? Hello. Um, so I got actually inspired by my time in Bangladesh with working with people in the villages in Bangladesh, especially with women who were really able to, to change their situation, to organize themselves and to uh, fight for their rights. And uh, there was a tremendous change uh, from the 1980s to the uh, yeah, in the to the last years in the life of of people in in Bangladesh, and that is actually um, my background. And so with this, I came to the process of development of the uh, sustainable development goals. And um, here we have all the different elements of um, no poverty, no hunger, um, gender equality, and also reduced inequalities, just to name a few important. So this is actually um, a very good global framework, uh, which uh, is actually based on human rights. Um, but uh, yeah, we are here now at the UN and uh, with the seven and a half years at the halfway point, and we, we also see a lot of uh, frustration. It's a good point. If we're here at the UN High Level Political Forum, and we know in a couple of months, it'll be the UN Sustainable Development Goals Summit, and the theme is this is sort of halftime. You know, if you look at a football match, if you look at anything, we're at halfway. And there's many things that people have said that we're maybe 12% is on track, that we're not doing as well as we could. And if we look at Article 22 of the UDHR, it says everyone as a member of society has a right and is entitled to the realization through national efforts and international cooperation with the organization and resource of each state for the economic, social, and cultural rights that are indispensable for one's dignity and the free development of one's personality. As we look at that, how do you think and who do you think are really the champions so far, Mandeep, to actualize this article? And what are some of the actions we've seen that people are involved with to achieve the 2030 agenda and make sure that this isn't just, as they say, promises on paper, but more of a reality and policy. So the champions for the goals are certainly people, active citizens, and civil society organizations that promote the principles that are enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which draws from the principles enshrined in the UN Charter. Now, the people who 
all the responsibility for achievement of the Agenda 2030 are of governments, because governments hold the agency to implement the agenda. They have primary responsibility to ensure that the agenda is carried out in its entirety, while other aspect, other sectors of society, whether it's academia, whether it's civil society, whether it's elements of the private sector, we are all bound to implement the agenda, to promote its values, and, and ultimately to help work with governments as partners in, in realization of the agenda, but also to hold governments to account. So civil society organizations help ensure inclusive decision making. When Agenda 2030 commitments are carried through, they help ensure uh, uh, policy making uh, and service delivery to the most excluded people. And importantly, they act as watchdogs to ensure that the money that is that is dispersed is used for the purposes that they were intended. But as Ingo pointed out, we are at the half point of Agenda 2030, and it does, and it's not looking good. It's not looking good because of several reasons. It's not looking good because uh, governments uh, in many countries don't in, uh, don't care about the aspirations of the people. We have corrupt oligarchies in many parts of the world. We have authoritarian governments that privilege a few of their citizens as opposed to others. And we have a, glo a broken global multilateral system where countries are pursuing naked self-interest rather than the joint international interest and sol and ex and working in solidarity towards uh, you know towards all of humanity with each other towards the, those who are most deprived and that's is 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 the biggest tragedy of our times. Thank you so much, Ingo. If you could add a bit on how we can actualize this article better and what actions you see that are involved to promote and protect this important human right. Yeah, first of all, I, I do agree with Mandeep. So the, the people organizing themselves, that's something very strong at local and national level. But even at the UN, we can see more and more groups uh, being here and speaking for themselves, like persons with disabilities, communities discriminated by work and descent, uh, women in general. I think that makes it uh, uh, much stronger. Um, yeah, so one concrete point and, and very central for the SDG as agenda is social protection. In 2007-8, uh, during the financial crisis, there were only 20% of the global population covered by social protection in one form or, or the other. And uh, until 2020, that changed a lot to 45%, um, which is a very good progress. Um, but of course, it's definitely not enough. So during the COVID crisis, uh, governments tried uh, to support people, um, but they had limited budgets, like for three months, uh, maybe for six months. And afterwards, uh, they could not continue. And, and this is a, it's a big question. So we can achieve the um, sustainable development goals only if we have really social protection flaws for all. And uh, that would be possible. Um, it would cost 79 million, um, sorry, billion um, US dollars per year for the least developed countries. That's 15% of their uh, gross um, uh, national product. That's too much for them alone. So they need to get support at least for some years until they can fully cover themselves. And middle income countries would need uh, to pay around 3%. So that's possible to, to create this right um, to food, um, right to survival for everybody. And, and that's even possible in the next uh, uh, 10 years. So, um, but um, there's, there's not the political will. Well, that's an excellent point. And it also shows that it's possible. I also like the way you're pointing that we have the amount of resources. It's just that we're not spending it in the right way. So there's too much on consumption, too much on militarization. But maybe you can share with us with Civicus how you're looking at changing things. And also, I really like, Mindy, what you said earlier. In a way, we are human rights defenders, but now we also have to be the enforcers as well. We demand the rights that are guaranteed under international law, but then we have to make sure that the governments live up to that. Can you share a bit, maybe the most recent Civicus report that outlines really the trends of where we're at and what we're up against, but how civil society is being able to be an agent of change and actually keep us in the game for the global goals at this halftime juncture for justice. So at Civicus, we produce two annual reports, which are of extreme importance to the achievement of Agenda 2030. 
Our first report measures civic freedoms, the freedoms of expression, association, and peaceful assembly, without which civil society cannot push for transformative change. It enables people to come out of the streets, demand their rights. It enables people to organize, to participate, to communicate without hindrance. So civic space is absolutely critical. Our report, which is on the Civicus Monitor, which is a participatory platform to measure civic freedoms of expression, association, and peaceful assembly, finds that at this point of time, in 117 countries and territories around the world, in which 85% of the world's population live, there are very, very serious restrictions in law, policy, and practice on exercise of civic freedoms, without which we can't demand accountability, without which we can't shape the priorities of our decision makers, without which we can't point to the fault lines that, that, that are there within the achievement of Agenda 2030. So that's a huge challenge. And, uh, con you know, conversely, we find that just 3.2% of the world's population live in countries where there's open and enabled civic space. That is where you know, civil society can have actually good partnerships with, with, with governments. Uh, and, and it's hugely challenging. In fact, our report on the Civicus Monitor finds that there are some serious kinds of impediments that are placed on activists, journalists, and organizations to impede them from their human rights work. And, and Agenda 2030 is largely a human rights agenda. In fact, there's been some studies uh, amongst organizations that over 90% of the Agenda 2030 commitments are uh, uh, com enshrined in the International Bill of Rights, that is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, along with the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So this is, remains a huge, huge challenge. We also find that in many parts of the world, protesters are being persecuted and detained to prevent them from coming out peacefully into the streets. Now, we know that transformative change around the world was achieved through the right to peaceful protest, whether it was decolonization, whether it's the civil rights movement, whether it's pro uh, movements for gender justice uh, and, and equality for uh, LGBTQI plus rights, or for young people who have highlighted the climate emergency. This has all happened through the right to peaceful protest where people have uh, urged decision makers to act. So the right to peaceful protest continues to be impeded. And lastly and importantly, uh, the, there's lots of uh, laws that many governments have introduced where civil society organizations are not able to receive funding from credible international sources. They use um, the terms such as foreign agents laws or foreign donations laws, whereas uh, private sector is able to receive funding freely, but civil society organizations that focus on transparency, accountability, and participation are unable to receive funding. And then we have our second report, which is the State of Civil Society report, which we publish every year. That finds that our global governance institutions are failing. They are failing to stop conflict around the world because of great power struggles that are taking place in these institutions. And the United Nations was formed, firstly, with the primary purpose of saving future generations from the scourge of war. And, and that remains a huge challenge. There are also more newer challenges, such as disinformation that is spread through, uh, through the social media, uh, through uh, hate speech, and and a basic erosion of democratic values, even in countries where we thought the, the argument for democracy had been won. So that remains a huge challenge for the achievement of Agenda 2030 through rising authoritarianism and through populist leaders who care more about their own political priorities rather than the interests of the people they are supposed to serve. Mahala Mandeep, and those reports that come out annually are so important to take the temperature, really, of the global body politic and provide some direction of what we as civil society can do to then help one another, to identify the issues, but then really initiate insights to be able to create new initiatives that change these international institutions. And we know, Ingo, you're very active with people's assemblies that are coordinated, usually around the UN General Assembly and these important meetings. Can you share with us what the people's assemblies are, how those are being planned? and how they'll be able to contribute to the 2030 agenda and making sure that we can actually achieve those 17 global goals on the ground. So the basic idea of the People's Assemblies is that the people who are affected by injustice and poverty should themselves speak for, the, uh, for their interests, for their rights. So they come together at community level, at grassroots level, and analyze their situation and what kind of um, demands they have 
to achieve the Agenda 2030 in their country. So they they organize pe uh, national people's assemblies um, where they all the different marginalized groups or excluded groups come together, persons with disabilities, uh, indigenous people, uh, women's groups, youth groups, older people, and uh, formulate their uh, demands to the governments. And um, then they send this um, to the governments in the form of a letter, they do a press conference, uh, before the um, presidents um, or heads of states go to New York to the UN summit. So they, they, they give their message to their governments and to the media. And then they bring the message to the Global People's Assembly, which will uh, meet uh, on 17th and 18th September in New York, to bring all these uh, perspectives from uh, 35 countries from around the world into the um, yeah, global meeting here at the UN and uh, to bring this also to the UN summit. So maybe um, if I mention one example um, or two examples of um, topics which uh, which came up in the last uh, months, um, so, so the, the debt crisis is affecting many countries. Um, there were countries like Zambia, who, which defaulted, uh, some more countries uh, like, like Sri Lanka, but there are many countries actually in the, in the uh, debt uh, distress, as it's called. So they, they pay a lot of um, their resources, like 25% uh, or more of, of, of their um, tax income for uh, de debt services. That is many times more they pay um, for, um, for for the debt services than for uh, social protection, for health, for education, and uh, governments have to cut um, those um, social services to pay the debts, um, and that's a, that's a really big problem, and it, it's not taken care of, and this this is one of the key issues coming uh, from the people's assemblies and um, so they demand actually at global level um, to to find a better, a better solution so the un um, can and should play a role um, but um, yeah that's also one of the problems that um, many of the g20 countries actually don't uh, allow the un to play this role that's really good and maybe you can share also just a short follow up there are it's an ability for individuals to apply and groups to apply for action for 2030 agenda leading up to those 10 days in September. If they have a program or a project that they can apply for small grants to be able to be involved with action for 2030. Yes, yeah, so there's this uh, global week to act for SDGs from 15th to 25th September um, and um, People are organizing all kinds of different um, actions around the world. Um, and there's this um, funding opportunity to get $500 for these actions. Um, so um, yeah, it would be good to, to get many proposals. Thank you so much. And we're here at the UN High Level Political Forum. It's the final gathering before the UN SDG Summit in September. Could you share Mandeep, some highlights of what you've seen, either in the first week of what's happened at the HLPF or during the weekend workshop, or what you're looking forward to this second week with many of the voluntary national reviews taking place of many countries to see people coming together to make sure that these 17 goals are realized. So voluntary national reviews, as you as by the, as their name indi indicates, are basically reviews that countries undertake voluntarily to report on the achievement of certain sustainable development goals, which are under review every year. And civil society organizations have joined government delegations in some instances and, and, and have been part of the voluntary national review process in others uh, over, over, the course of, over the course of this past week and, you know, and will continue to advocate going forward. Now, the experience of civil society organizations is often mixed. So if the state of democracy in a country is is strong if the government of the day and the democratic institutions and structures are supportive, then civil society is able to shine a spotlight on, on, on what is happening. And we heard about some good examples like from Ireland, where civil society presented a report alongside uh, the, the government report, and they and they were able and their report was able to, you know, provide a critical assessment on what, what's going on. But in other instances, they, you know, civil society found themselves excluded from the process, and they believe that the government report presented an overly positive picture on the st state of achievement of the sustainable development goals, and seem more like a public relations exercise 
rather than a true assessment uh, or, a, a, or a review of what the state of achievement of sustainable development goals was. So, so there are these different kinds of experiences and challenges that, that, uh, that you know, that civil societies continue to experience. Uh, in some countries where there are good state civil society relationships, you know, this can be a really constructive and strong process, and it has been for, 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 for some states. But in other places, it's also an opportunity for civil society to put together a shadow report, which uh, presents a, a perhaps truer picture of what the state of achievement of the sustainable development goals is. Now, going forward to agenda, to the uh, to the sustainable uh, development goals, the SDG summit in in uh, in September later this year, and in the coming conversations, there's a lot of conversation, as Ingo highlighted a little bit earlier, is about the SDG action and stimulus plan to uh, with, by focusing on debt restructuring and debt cancellation because it's become unsustainable for several countries to be able to pay uh, their debts because of the interest rates and the uh, the challenges with the, how the global economy is structured. Now, these conversations are going to be absolutely critical because they're going to free up uh, resources for governments to ensure that they can actually meet their commitments under Agenda 2030. They can create better lives for their people. They can protect the most vulnerable. But it's going to be absolutely critical while these conversations are happening that we ensure that civil society is involved in the process, that civil society is treated as equal partners in these countries where public resources will be freed up so that they are not used to uh, strengthen in uh, uh, networks of patronage they are not used to strengthen repressive state apparatuses that oftentimes exist in countries uh, to uh, shut down journalists who expose corruption, for instance, and that they are not used to further strengthen military infrastructures and those who profit from them. So we really need to ensure that social protection flows uh, that Ingo uh, talked about, they're used to support social protection flows, that they're used to strengthen democratic institutions, and they're uh, used to actually achieve Agenda 2030 goals in their entirety. Uh, and, and, and governments have a really important responsibility to do this, and we as a society will be watching them. But it's also important for the UN's own leadership to be strong uh, on these issues, to emphasize the value of civil society partnership, to emphasize the rights-based approach of the sustainable development goals. They are a vast improvement of the Millennium Development Goals because they are comprehensive in their framework and they look at the three pillars of sustainable development, economic justice, social development, and environmental sustainability. So that's going to be absolutely critical going forward. And those conversations are going to unfold in the coming days and in the run-up to the SDG Summit in September. Really great point, and also pointing out in many ways the improvements to have furthest behind first in this 2030 agenda. Also, leave one no one behind. Absolutely, two important steps as opposed to the Millennium Development Goals that were more of putting everything into half. Maybe Inko, you can share with us a bit as well how you see uh, what's important going forward and what's important that we can stress uh, looking at the future of this right. Okay, so um, I think we um, the one point we have stressed, stressed already is that we really have concrete improvements um, like social protection. But the other um, point, which is the other uh, part of the um, of the coin, um, that there are the structural changes in the uh, global economic system or the financial architecture. So we have a system nowadays which was built in 1944, still during the Second World War where the rich nations basically have the control on the International Monitoring Fund and the World Bank, um, and yeah, so also on the UN Security Council. So um, yeah, that, that's actually a system which is not any more fitting to the uh, world nowadays, and it's not uh, creating the solutions. So um, it's, I think it's a, it's a good moment to uh, make uh, progress on this, um, because there's a general understanding. Of course, the uh, UN Security Council, that's um, it's a very difficult, uh, as uh, um, the, the five eight powers will not accept. But uh, for the other, for the international financial institutions, I believe um, we need leadership um, from, uh, from the Global South uh, governments, but we need also pressure from civil society um, to change this uh, system. And uh, I mean, there's there are some very simple things. For example, the the, the G20 um, 
the African Union needs to be part of the G20. Um, th I think that's uh, that's totally evident. Um, but uh, still, this uh, didn't happen until now. So, um, but uh, yeah, the other things. Uh, I mean, those are only uh, examples or, or uh, symbols, but uh, still, they are important. Um, um, it is like the IMF. Um, um, head is always coming from Europe and the World Bank uh, from the United States, and and um, that uh, doesn't work anymore. No, it's important as we look and see where we're at on the 75th anniversary of the UDHR and the halfway point of the UN SDGs. I think the theme, of course, in the conversation was halfway there, yet so far away at the same time. So in our final moments, Mandeep, could you share with us some final thoughts on a vision for the future of Article 22 and potential paths to respect, protect, fulfill this right? I would say that you know we, we all have a responsibility to uphold human rights, to advocate for human rights, to stand up for justice and equality and sustainability. And, and that's really is the vision I would like to, you know, to share. And tomorrow is Nelson Mandela Day uh, on Tuesday, 18th of July. And I just wanted to emphasize that on this day, as even in today's day and age, there are thousands of Nelson Mandela's languishing in prisons around the world, civil society colleagues like us, and there are others who've been assassinated, like the Honduran civil society activist, Bertha Casares, who was seeking environmental justice. And let's spare a thought for them. Let's see how we can support, uh, support uh, those to ensure that that those who represent the finest values of humanity in civil society are not assassinated and those who are languishing in prison are released forthwith. Great point. It's also, of course, International Mandela Day honoring his legacy of pushing for advocacy, accountability, and democracy for all. Inglo, your final thoughts on vision for the future? So I think we really need to come to a, uh, to more solidarity uh, global. Um, I mean, this is what I really sense here at the UN, coming together with so many great activists from all over the world, and uh, it, that's one of the of the good uh, things I really like to see. What the people do all uh, all over the world in the different fields, whether it's environment, uh, climate, women's rights. So uh, that is really motivating, and that uh, gives me hope for the future. Great point, and it's actually true. That's probably the strength of the Voluntary National Review. We know the UNHLPF unites humanity around these VNRs because the civil society share peer programs and projects on how they're working and inspire one another. And that allows us to then hopefully achieve Article 22, where the resources of each state recognizes economic, social, and cultural rights expressed also in the UN Global Goals. And we know these are indispensable for dignity and free development. Thank you both for your time. and. We'll continue the struggle here at the UN. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.